Welcome, everybody, to the Across the Sky podcast. We are the Lee Enterprises weather team. We come to you from all across the country, all across the sky, to bring you the latest and greatest in weather and climate and beyond every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm meteorologist Joe Martucci at the Press of Atlantic City. Joined with me is Sean Sublett at the Richmond Times-Dispatch, Kirsten Lang at the Tulsa World, and Matt Hollander, who covers many, many properties in the Midwest here. Uh, crew, it, it's not often we all of us get together, but we are all here. Sean, I'll start with you. What's going on down in Richmond? Tell you what, we're finally uh, drying out. We had the, the remnant low that used to be hurricane slash tropical storm Ian. Uh, and as many people in the weather biz know, it kind of merged with this upper level feature and just spun offshore for like three or four days. So it's finally sunny here. This is a Thursday when we're recording it. So we're finally getting out of a cloudy and damp period. Uh, very happy to be back into the 70s this time of year. But the cooler air is coming from Matt Hollander's way in about a day and a half or so. Uh, so fall certainly in the air here in the Commonwealth. Yeah, uh, Matt usually gets a sneak preview of what we're seeing. And Sean, you said four days. How about six days? We had it six days here at the Jersey Shore. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, we you just had got sunny too. You clearly had it worse right there at the shore. But, you know, in Richmond, where I'm at, it wasn't too bad regarding the amount of water, whether that be, right. you know, the water coming down. We had an inch and a half of rain, but it was a lot worse down in Metropolitan Hampton Roads, that Norfolk, Portsmouth, Virginia Beach area, uh, where they had multiple inches of rain. In fact, interestingly enough, a lot of that location up until a few days ago was in a, a modest drought, uh, and that drought is now officially gone. We checked the drought monitor this morning and Hampton Roads is, is no longer in a drought, which will come to the surprise of no one. Yeah, uh, inches of rain will do that. Same thing almost here. We still have some areas in drought, but um, one corner of my coverage area got over nine inches of rain over the past six days. So mm. uh, nice, a uh, lot of stuff going on there. Uh, Kirsten, speaking of drought, I think you guys are still in drought in Tulsa, right? It's, like a, it's a worse drought now. You see, worse drought. Yeah, basically, Sean has all the things that I wish we had, right? I mean, he had the rain <laughs> and the cooler temps. And, uh, you know, we're sitting here just waiting for, for rain. I, uh, you know, that's the last time we had any kind of measurable rainfall was September 2nd. And it was a hundredth of an inch <laughs> in Tulsa County, in oh. Tulsa County. So, um, so, you know, crossing our fingers that we may get something coming up on Monday. Uh, aside from that, it's just been dry and uh, sunny. So, you know, just completely opposite from what you guys are seeing. Well, Matt, everyone keeps talking about you. So we'll turn it over to you. What's going on in uh, Chicago land over there? Well, we're glad we didn't have to deal with the tropical system that so much of the Southeast was dealing with. But now it's uh, a little bit of a taste a taste of winter. There are quite a few places in the Midwest that uh, coming up Friday night might see their first freeze of the season. And there'll be a lot more of those to come. So I'm, uh, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm about to say goodbye to the, the, the nice weather, I think, where we have regularly temperatures in the 70s. I think that's going to become less and less of a, of a regular thing. It's going to be back to the frigid tundra of the Midwest. Uh, so, I mean, it's still October. We'll get some, some warm up still, but I'm like, oh no, here we go. Talking about freezing temperatures. Next thing you know, we're going to be talking about snow. I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> uh, yes. No, <laughs> let's, uh, can we hold off on another maybe two months before we uh, talk about snow? Actually preview, we will have a winter weather uh, podcast, winter forecast coming up at the end of the month, probably going to do a two week special on it. Speaking of special, we have a special guest, um, and it's not because him and I have the same name, uh, but it's because he is a tremendous researcher, uh, somebody very involved in the weather community. Um, we have Joseph Trujillo Falcon. Um, he is a research scientist for NOAA's Cooperative Institutes, um, and then which is that, excuse me, I should say that is in conjunction with NOAA's Severe Storm Laboratories. In addition to that, unrelated to NOAA, he is a meteorologist for My Radar. And he's also the chair for the American Meteorological Society's Committee for Hispanic and Latinx Advancement. Joseph, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Always a wonderful time to spend with y'all and share some really wonderful insights. Yeah, and I see uh, you said y'all, so I guess that makes it four to one on the y'all versus you guys thing. So I'm not doing too good here today, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, you know, Joseph, we uh, a lot of the inspiration for having you come on here was a talk we actually saw at the American Meteorological Society's broadcast conference 
about translating severe weather warnings from English to Spanish. And for, I'll just speak on behalf of myself, um, I didn't realize how many different uh, forms or dialects of Spanish there are and how complicated and how many people really takes to really drive these changes where people, you know, who speak Spanish in the United States can get um, active, you know, weather alerts in their language. So I know that's a lot, but let me start off by asking um, you yourself, I read on your website, you're interested in broadcast meteorology, but things, you know, relating to this research that you're doing help transform you from going from broadcast meteorology into what you're doing now? Yeah, you know, some some insight into my life, really, I was born in Peru and moved to the US when I was five years old. And, you know, experiencing different weather hazards altogether was an experience of its own. <laughs> you know, uh, I've never really thought of the concept of a thunderstorm before arriving to the United States. And growing up, my community was always afraid of it, uh, did not really know how to respond to it. So I was seeing a lot of these vulnerabilities firsthand. And that's what initially uh, drove me to want to pursue a career in broadcast meteorology. You know, I wanted to one day be on television in a bilingual broadcast station and be able to provide that service to my own community. Uh, however, I started seeing the discrepancies uh, really through the internships that I was in, uh, you know, through the, the green screen takes and everything all around. I was coming to learn that even to this day, there's no official English to Spanish weather and climate dictionary for Spanish and really all other languages here in the United States. And because of that, there is some inconsistencies in how we communicate weather and climate information going forward. And that all relates back to the dialect or the form of Spanish that we speak. And, you know, language is such a beautiful thing. It, it all comes down to your culture, how you were raised, where you were raised, and even your socioeconomic status. And, you know, language is beautiful in its own right. It's very diverse and all over the place. But when it comes to emergency messaging, we have to make sure that messages are consistent and that everyone understands the given messages at hand. And that's what really inspired a lot of the work that we do today. These different varieties of Spanish, though they exist out there, there are solutions going forward to find dialect neutral translations and develop terminology that can resound with everyone, no matter where you're from or how you're raised. So, so let me ask, and I, I kind of made a joke about y'all versus you guys, but you know, like I get the point. Like if you say y'all, I, I understand what you mean. Is it those kind of differences we're seeing in the Spanish language or is it, you know, if you're saying, you know, it's a severe thunderstorm warning the way it, it has been for a while, is it just not even identifiable with some Spanish speech? You know, dialects in general can range anywhere for the most uh, silliest words to, you know, even emergency messaging overall. Uh, one fun example is actually the word straw. There's just very completely different ways to say it in Latin America from popote to pajilla to cañita and you're just like whoa where did all this come from and i always like to begin my presentations by showing a, an example of that just to show how diverse the language is but really the first time we explored this in in a weather concept was through the spc risk category research uh, you know through research at our cooperative institute we came to find that the original spanish translations for the spc risk categories one of those particular words like the translation for slight uh, initially it was leve uh, that word was only practiced in really in Spain, according to dialectical experts. And so if you were from Latin America and, you know, I could relate to this being from Peru, I never really saw that word before and didn't really understand what that meant. And, you know, at the end of the day, what I, I always like to emphasize with this type of work is that we need to focus on translating the meaning and not just the exact word, because when it comes to translation, you can develop different varieties of that translation, but we need to focus in on translating and honing in on that meaning. And through our research is where we recommended to the SBC to switch that translation from leve to bajo or low, which is a more universally understood way of, you know, there's still a hazard present, but it's not as abundant. And so that's something that we went moving forward with. And, you know, it could even spread to other meteorological terminology as well. You know, we just uh, highlighted a little bit and previewed a little about winter weather, snow squalls, for example, there's educational campaigns happening in the English language at the moment. However, there's still we still haven't really been able to come up with a true translation for snow squall, and it hasn't been technically defined in a lot of our current dictionaries. And so it really goes back to the question of if you can't describe a given phenomenon to a given individual, how do you expect them to eventually respond to it and take action? Hey, Joseph, Sean here. I, I think that's that's so spot on. 
because I think some of us have been doing this a long time in English have realized that even some of the English words we've tossed around don't mean to the public what we think they mean. I mean, you go back to the term squall and there's a lot of people in the United States that don't know what a squall is, right? To, so then to try to take that word, translate it uh, is even more of a complex issue. So I, I really think that's a excellent point is to, to work on translating the impacts or what people are going to notice out of a specific weather phenomenon whether that be severe weather, whether that be snow squall, whether it be a certain kind of wind. Because um, my understanding is that there, there are several different ways just to express stormy weather uh, in various Spanish uh, dialects. I mean, I hear the word tormenta thrown around a lot, but I would imagine that's something very specific. Yeah, uh, you know, really here in the United States, the word tormenta is a universally way of translating the word thunderstorm. But really, a lot of our bilingual weather enterprise comes from the uh, from Puerto Rico. And a lot of Puerto Rican meteorologists grow up to learn thunderstorms as the word tronada. And so for the bilingual broadcast meteorologists that end up coming to the United States, they're always told, hey, don't, don't use the word tronada because people won't understand that. You're going to have to use tormenta here if you're going to be a broadcast meteorologist in the United States, because that's what people come to know to understand. And so that's what we mean about, you know, developing some more consistent terminology uh, going forward. And really our research, of course, there's a lot of uh, still translation work to do to this day. But we, what we've really emphasized on is that, you know, we have to really contextualize language and really consider it under the lens of how often do these people practice these words altogether. And we trace this all back to bilingual health communication research, because they've really paved the way for a lot of this work to really flourish in the last couple of years. And, you know, when it comes, let's, let's think about it in a, in a medical context, you know, people won't be practicing or really saying a lot of medical terminology every day. And so it's much easier to, you know, come up with the word and go on an educational campaign on it. And that could be said the same for weather terminology too, like snow squalls or other scientific terminology. But when it comes to risk terminology, weather isn't exclusively the only place we practice these words in, you know, you see risk words behind a bleach bottle, you see it through COVID messaging and all other aspects. And so that's where culture kicks in. That since we're using these words on a lot more frequent basis, this is where the dialects truly matter. And that's where social science research comes in to try to find better solutions and provide the different translations and try to measure how people, you know, associate urgency and probability with the given translation so that we can provide those recommendations forward to our federal agencies. Uh, and Joseph, and your your efforts right now really too are to, I, I guess, educate um, the bilingual broadcast meteorologists, but also I'm assuming those that work at the National Weather Service. Is that true? So they can receive it in print. Uh, that is correct. You know, we work very closely with two voluntary translation teams within the National Weather Service. Uh, they are the Spanish outreach team that focuses more on educational campaigns and graphics, and then uh, the multimedia assistance in Spanish team uh, that focus on focuses on translating short-term things such as warnings and outlooks and even some watches. And yeah, we work hand in hand with them. They have a small version of their dictionary as well that we've put on the AMS website just to give it some more exposure. And, you know, we've been also working alongside them to, you know, explore, are there currently, currently any terminology out there that we're a little bit confused on that we'd like some more insight in? And really the bilingual enterprise has really stepped up here. You know, we've been very open with one another and sharing our thoughts and, you know, bringing in the research component too, because at the end of the day, I'm a fond believer that even I can have any opinion out there, but what truly matters is the communities that we are serving. And that's why I'm such a huge believer of social science research. You know, let's get the perspectives from the public that we're serving so that we can find those strategic strategies to uh, reach them and engage them. Hey, Joseph, it's Matt. And I'm curious about how uh, social media comes into play with this, because, you know, one thing I've noticed on Facebook, uh, when I see posts that are in Spanish, Facebook will automatically translate those posts, but I'm curious how effective those translations are. And, and I had some experience this when I was in the Rio Grande Valley, deep South Texas, lots of Spanish speakers down there. I would wonder for folks who speak Spanish, they would see my Facebook posts and they probably would have the opposite where it was being translated from English to Spanish. And I just wonder how effective those translations are. I, I just kind of take it for, since I'm not a Spanish speaker, I always kind of take it for face value, but I'm always curious what's getting lost in this automated translation that Facebook is doing. That's the one where I most commonly see it. Do you have any 
insight into how accurate those translations are or do words get left out or, you know, a lot of context get lost? What is your opinion on that? You know, those automated translations do a wonderful job in translating the, the more basic words. But when it comes to the actual terminology, since even to this day, we don't have a set definition for these type of words, it'll mess a lot of it up. One of my favorite um, examples is, you know, whenever we put tornado watch in English, and then the algorithm automatically translates it to Spanish. Uh, it translates the word watch, not in how we want to convey it, but an actual clock like a watch. So, you know, a lot of Spanish speakers will read tornado clock on there instead. And you're like, wait, what does that mean? <laughs> and so, you know, that's why we've been working hand in hand with the National Weather Service translation teams so that we can develop these graphics in Spanish so that they're more accessible, first of all, you know, more visually appealing and can reach more people, but also provide them with the right translation so that we're not too dependent on these uh, on these uh, automated translations to get the message across. Hey, Joseph, I'm thinking, you know, given how vast the United States is, right, and how many different dialects there are in Spanish, is, is there some regionality you have to bring to this like for example is somebody in new york city going to have to or, or ideally going to say something different than someone in you know let's say chicago as opposed to phoenix 100 percent. and a lot of our bilingual broadcast meteorologists have done a spectacular job and you know really getting to know their local community so like for example uh, where i grew up in dfw you know there's a, a significant mexican population there but that cannot be this said the same for other places like you were mentioning in new york or even florida and, you know, it's important to localize the information and make sure that it's engaging to them. And this really goes beyond just translation. A lot of, of our work has also been trying to delve in into the climate world and really exploring about, you know, right now there's been a significant push between broadcast meteorologists to, uh, you know, share local information on climate and something that, you know, is more personalized for people. But in terms of bilingual broadcast me meteorologists, you know, the place where someone lives in the U.S. might not necessarily be quote unquote home. And trying to link uh, climate stories off to Latin America where people were raised and where people have more familiarity with. And so really, it really goes beyond just dialects because at the end of the day, like we can develop dialect neutral translations and especially the risk terminology and the things that matter most to us and uh, go forward in standardizing at least part of the more technical terminology. But I think at the end of the day, it's a, a more important conversation to be able to truly personalize the message and take in the concept that to a lot of these Spanish speakers here in the United States, which by the way, by 2060, nearly one in four Americans will speak Spanish, that they, you know, a lot of them in the countries that they were raised in don't have this culture of checking the weather, you know, there wasn't a twister in Espanol that a lot of people uh, watched growing up. And, you know, there's even some countries like Panama that are only recently opening a federal weather agency just this last year. And so that culture of being weather aware in, uh, all overall is really not as present in some Latin American countries, because of course, uh, there's places like Puerto Rico and La Dominica Republicana that experience hurricanes, uh, you know, every year, and then Argentina that sees hail, but there's some countries like, for example, Guatemala, that don't see as, uh, you know, more severe weather hazards that we are used to here in the U.S. Hey, Joseph, does it make sense, you know, I always worry about doing generalizations, but, you know, when you want to, to cast as wide a net as possible, do you think there is any validity to the idea that on the on the East Coast, let's say from a New York City down to to D.C., uh, Florida, that's going to be more of a, a Puerto Rican version of, of Spanish language compared to places in, uh, let's say, a Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, going into certainly into California, into Arizona. Those are going to be more of a Central American or Mexican uh, derived dialect? Yeah, no, uh, you know, it's very important to look at local data, especially census data that can really give you a glimpse as to what your com uh, community is comprised of and what kind of uh, Hispanic and Latinx populations are in your given community. So you can tailor that information going forward. And I know this can be really tough. You know, we're already asking a lot of, out of our weather and climate enterprise, you know, and finding these solutions going forward. And that's really where we've stepped up uh, to the plate. We recently just got a three-year NOAA grant 
to be able to do nationwide surveys on Spanish speakers uh, for the next upcoming years and asking them about the different weather hazards, not only about what they're currently experiencing right now, but what they experience in their home countries as well, and be able to link that up with U.S. Census data and develop a tool in the future that, you know, if you're curious about, you know, maybe your uh, WFO region for a forecaster, like I, I am in the Dallas-Fort Worth um, weather forecast office, and I want to learn more about my community. We're trying to develop a tool that you can click on and, you know, for it to comprise like, hey, this is the composition of your Hispanic community, according to recent census data. And then using the survey and social science that we've used, here are what, you know, Mexicans are most familiar with and least familiar with. This is what, uh, you know, uh, Salvadorians are most familiar with and least familiar with. And so, so for us to develop more effective educational campaigns going forward, because, you know, at the end of the day, if you live in Florida and you're trying to teach a lot of Puerto Ricans about hurricane hazards, they grew up with that. They have generational knowledge of that. But tornadoes, probably a different story. All right. Sounds good. We are going to wrap up this half and we'll come back to you in just a little bit after a short break. You're listening to the Across the Sky podcast. Michael J. for Hope for the Warriors. Started back in 06 at Camp Lejeune. Military families witnessing the effects of war on their loved ones. Now, almost 20 years later, they've aided over 53,000 service members, veterans, and families with confidential, high-quality behavioral health care services at little or no cost to post-9-11 vets and their families. Over 91% of every dollar donated goes directly to the programs. If you're as concerned about our heroes as I am, go to hopeforthewarriors.org. Looking beyond the atmosphere, here's Tony Rice with your Astronomy Outlook. There will be a lunar occultation of the planet Uranus on Wednesday morning, visible from the western United States and upper Midwest. Occultations occur when one celestial body passes in front of another, blocking it from view from a few minutes to a few seconds, depending on the distance. Uranus is 1.7 billion miles away, and very dim as a result. The moon, it's only a few days past full, so it's pretty bright. That means this is going to require at least a moderate-sized telescope to view. But this is also something that happens only a few times a year, and most astrophotographers, they tend to have things like this marked on their calendars. So look out for images after the event. Like solar eclipses, which are also technically occultations, when and what this event looks like varies widely by your location. Here in the U.S., it's only going to be visible from points north and west of a line that extends from the Baja Peninsula to Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Even then, the view will be very different from, say, Minneapolis to Seattle to San Diego. When viewed from Seattle, Uranus will pass behind the full diameter of the moon, hiding it for a full hour beginning at 10.05 p.m. Pacific. While in Minneapolis, it'll disappear near the moon's south pole at 12.36 a.m. Central, re-emerging less than 30 minutes later at about the southeastern point. Observing occultations do also have a scientific purpose. Through the years they've been used to refine calculations of the size of the sun and moon, astrophotographers use the light shining from the planet to highlight lunar peaks and valleys during lunar occultations like this one and it also provides a rare opportunity to better see distant moons as the brighter planet is blocked. Elsewhere in the sky, look for the moon to pass by Mars before you turn in on Friday evening. The pair will rise around 10 p.m. That's your Astronomy Outlook. Follow me at RTP Hokey for more spacey stuff like this. Thanks, Tony, for that. Always appreciate it. And we are back here with Joseph Trujillo Falcon uh, with NOAA, also with My Radar. Uh, but we were talking primarily about um, translating English watches, warnings, advisories, all that hazard messaging into Spanish, but into a Spanish that can be consumed by many um, Latin Americans who make their home here in the United States. Um, Joseph, I have to say, you know, uh, we said off camera, you're only 25 years old and you're already doing quite a lot here, which is tremendous. Um, you know, who have you looked up to in the couple of short years you've been working Um in terms of, you know, your research and just becoming a better meteorologist? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of people uh, that have really paved the way for a lot of the success stories, at least in my own personal career life. Uh, the very first person that, that comes to mind was the, the person who really motivated me to really pursue this and really go beyond just like, 
you know, having it be ideas and turning into action. That's Irene Sands. Like I remember when I was a, a junior in my undergraduate degree, I visited her at an AMS conference and I was, you know, a little intimidated because in, in, in College Station, you know, there, there isn't a bilingual network. And I was trying to look for a mentor that, that spoke Spanish. And, you know, it's always very intimidating at first to go up to a meteorologist and talk to them and set up a conversation. And she was always there for me. And like, you know, I now call her like Dia Irene, like <laughs> she's my auntie, like we we're we're close like that. And, you know, she's always been so inspiring. And at, that's actually where, where a lot of our work within the AMS committee formed, because we wanted to increase the representation and increase the access for a lot of Hispanic and Latinx scientists across the enterprise and give them role models and give them people to look up to in a solid network uh, that can always provide them with resources. And, you know, that's that was really the start of, of, of that committee. And so Irene Sands has always been a wonderful, wonderful person I've always looked up to. You know, it's really funny to say because now uh, she's one of my supervisors, but Dr. Kim Cloco McLean, I also met throughout my undergraduate years and she has just been a fantastic scholar in a lot of social science research and really paving the way for this to become important in the weather enterprise. You know, even like a decade ago, social science wasn't as prioritized in our spaces. And now it's one of the topics that are leading a lot of the conversations nowadays. And, you know, I have a lot of people to, to thank in that sort of realm for really paving the way for this, this type of research to really provide insights and for everyone to be able to be so open and welcoming to it. But goodness gracious, we could take the rest of the podcast time to talk about people that have <laughs> really inspired my career to this day. <laughs> no, that, that's great. And uh, Irene and I were actually on a panel at the broadcast conference, the American Meteorological Society's broadcast conference this year. And uh, she's great. She's she's always very busy. It sounds like I, I know she's always doing something, but uh, but but she was a great addition as we were talking about digital meteorology and her work with my radar as well, which you know you're a part of too. Um, but I'll turn it over. Anybody else uh, want to shoot Joseph over a question? And we've had Kim on across the sky. She was one of our, one of our early episodes. Uh, so we know Kim very well as, as well. And just what I want to ask you about is, you know, there's certain parts of the country where there are lots of Spanish speakers and, you know, you have uh, Spanish speaking channels. People can get access to if they want weather information in Spanish, they can find it pretty easily. Again, <laughs> when I was in the Rio Grande Valley, it was very accessible. In fact, we actually had some Spanish speaking meteorologists on our team there. We had a separate channel where we did newscasts in Spanish and weather reports in Spanish. It was very easy for folks there, since there are lots of Spanish speakers, to have access to information in Spanish. But I know there are some isolated Spanish speakers in the country in areas where there are not many other Spanish speakers. And I'm thinking definitely in parts of the Midwest where I now cover, there are certainly people that speak Spanish, but not in large numbers. And so I always worry about them having more trouble getting information, you know, especially with the very active weather we have in the Midwest and dealing with tornado watches and tornado warnings. And so what is your recommendation, you know, if folks are, are, are listening in and are wanting to know, you know, where they can turn, if they're in an area where they can't watch a Spanish language newscast and get information, you know, life-saving information potentially on a newscast, you know, where should they go to get information that they need if they need it to be in Spanish for the weather. Matt, first of all, what an important distinction uh, you made there. You know, across the United States, there's areas like, you know, even where I grew up in DFW, where we had a whole team of bilingual broadcast meteorologists, but there's also areas out there that don't have someone that can lead that information. And, you know, linking it all, all together with Dr. Kim Cloco McLean, our, our research team within Ciro and NSSL went on a field study this last uh, March to learn more about communities and Spanish speaking communities and even immigrant communities uh, that were affected by the December 10 to 11th tornado outbreak in uh, you know, in Arkansas and in Kentucky and, and, uh, you know, all across all those four states. And we connected with people there. And we learned for the first time how communities that don't have access to multilingual information react to this, these given weather hazards. And we had noted instances where people would receive WIA alerts on their phone, those wireless emergency alerts. But since it was completely in English, people did not know what that meant. And with there being a tornado emergency in the area, they did not know what to do since it wasn't in a language that they understood. So instead of simply taking action, they turned it off because they didn't, and they admitted to it because they did not, were not able to understand what they were saying and the noise was freaking them out. 
And in addition, you know, it wasn't the, the, uh, any scientific experts that people were relying on in a place where there's no multilingual information available. They were relying on community leaders and what we call non-experts or people that aren't, you know, don't have a background in meteorology or able to provide actionable emergency recommendations. And so for a lot of these people that we also spoke to, you know, these community leaders, they were doing the best with what they could. You know, they were trying to translate some a couple of things forward, but they didn't really know what exactly to recommend since they haven't, you know, taken, you know, courses in emergency management or even in meteorology. And it really opens up that conversation to, you know, as our Spanish speaking communities are, are growing in number, especially in these next coming decades, how are we going to approach these communities, especially in the Midwest that are very vulnerable to several severe weather hazards, but that also don't have access to that information? Uh, you know, thankfully, uh, you know, we've talked with a lot of the English speaking meteorologists there like Ryan Vaughn there in, in, in Arkansas, and he's been able to automate some of the things that he does in English to Spanish, you know, beforehand. And so that whenever a, a watch or warning comes out in English and social media, it immediately comes out in Spanish. Some solutions that we propose to broadcast meteorologists is, hey, like, you know, you don't have to speak Spanish, if you, especially on a significant weather event. If you can come up with a short script and give it to a bilingual staff in your newsroom and make a Facebook Live out of it, it usually gets a lot of hits because it connects with a lot of people. And, uh, you know, we've had that done in KBTX and in and, and College Station as well. And it's reached a lot of Spanish speaking communities there. And then, of course, the graphics that the National Weather Service is producing. We produce English and Spanish language equivalents so that somebody that has no a knowledge of, uh, of Spanish can put them side by side. And there's pre-made captions there. And it's all part of the Weather Ready Nation uh, Spanish language resources that you can find on their website. And so there's a lot of resources that people can use. And of course, especially now, uh, I'm very grateful to, you know, first off, be part of a team in my radar that provides national coverage in Spanish. But, you know, also uh, a big shout out to the Weather Channel. They recently expanded their services to Spanish. They now have a Weather Channel in Espanol. So it does seem that in the short term, resources are expanding for this these communities and we want to provide this sort of stuff to them because now we've really seen how it can how people can be affected when they don't have that information at their disposal yeah just if you kind of hit some of the things i was going to ask because you know when reading your your bio you know you you had said and i think something that's even really surprising to me is that uh, you know, I guess I just assumed that there were always these types of resources out there, because if you've only been doing this for, you know, several years, that means this is a very new thing, um, which I guess is just very surprising, because like I said, you would think that this would have been something that would have been, you know, already taken care of or already covered, um, you know, here uh, across the country. But uh, it, yeah, what I was going to bring up was the fact that there seems to be a lot of expansion going on, um, you know, like you said, with the Weather Channel. Um, and then even I've noticed some local stations here in Tulsa have started to um, expand um, as well. So, you know, that's all these things uh, are, are really great. But, you know, how how surprised were you, I guess, when you first kind of got into this and, and saw that there was a slack of resources? You know, it, it, in a way, like, it was really the, the biggest reason why I went into the research world, because in my internships, you know, I, for, I remember one one time, like, trying to ask like, well, where, where is a dictionary that I can use? Cause you know, it, it put it in the, in the perspective of an aspiring bilingual uh, broadcast meteorologist that wants to get into the field. Most of the time you'll have to get your degree in English and say you graduate and go into the field a couple of weeks later and you're suddenly expected to snap right into Spanish. And, you know, let's be fair. That's why we don't have as many bilingual broadcast meteorologists out there to this day, because it's a lot easier to be an English speaking meteorologist since you've had four years of experience in that in your degree, rather than just snapping into it into Spanish. The lack of resources is what really has opened my eyes to why there's so many vulnerabilities to this day. And it's going to have to take a systemic, uh, you know, change within, you know, federal agencies, in addition to, you know, broadcast net networks and even in in academia spaces and how we even teach this going forward for us to start seeing some results in the long term. And so, yeah, no, you know, 
these kind of uh, inequities have really opened my eyes in many, many ways, but it's also showed me the importance of and how critical social science uh, goes into this, because if it wasn't for the for, for the work that, you know, not just our group has done, but even others at NCAR, you know, like Dr. Lorena Medina Luna out there that have really pushed for this increased need for bilingual resources through social science research, then, you know, a lot of this would have never made the airwaves. And I think it's very important, you know, when we start putting out the data and nature nationwide representation of like Spanish speakers to show that there's significant language inequities and show you the numbers, that's when people start paying attention. And that's where action is most likely to happen. Hey, Joseph, so just um, if you can share with everybody, like what, do you give us like a timeline for like your research and when we think some of this is going to, you know, actually be used, whether it's through the weather service or you're hoping to get it into the broadcast community? Recently, we just published uh, something uh, that is, highlights those language inequities when it comes to watch warning and advisory terminology. And, you know, for example, for this given study, we found that, you know, first off, the language inequities were very, very apparent. Well, you know, while 67% of English speakers correctly identified watch when they were given the definition and, you know, asked to ask whether it was a watch warning or they do not know, um, you know, only 38% of Spanish speakers were able to identify it correctly. And same thing for warning, 79% of English speakers identified the correct definition of a warning, while 60% of Spanish speakers did. And, you know, th those numbers can, can tell the, the entire story that even to this day, with the resources that we have, there's still inconsistencies in how we communicate it. And, you know, even our own governmental agencies haven't really agreed on a specific message to use because even FEMA is using different words than the weather service in their social media messaging for watch warning and advisory. And so through the social science research, we looked at all the different translations for the given words and ranked them in terms of urgency. We asked the participants to, and we are proposing to change the word aviso uh, to alerta because aviso is more of a pat on the back. It doesn't really convey the level of urgency while alerta is more of an actionable word that can take, you know, enact people to uh, take those preparedness actions that we want them to take. And now we have social science research that supports that. And so, you know, one thing is to publish it. <laughs> and now we got to, you know, propose it to the National Weather Service. So we're super excited to work with colleagues, uh, you know, both in the Weather Service and FEMA uh, so that we can find better solutions going forward. Because at the end of the day, you know, social Social science research is important, but we also want that uh, for our partners in the entire enterprise to have a say, because they're the frontline communicators. They are experts in engaging these given communities. And so, you know, uh, the time frame for this really is to first bring it up to the partners within our enterprise and then put it out for public comment in, in, in the next uh, coming months or even uh, a year or two so that everyone can have an opinion on what this proposed terminology change might mean. And, uh, you know, hopefully then through those recommendations, be able to implement this. But uh, we've already had success in this. Like, for example, the SPC risk categories in Spanish were recently adopted to what we recommended to just this last spring. And it was a huge victory for, for us in the social science field and really for our entire enterprise to finally have our federal agencies acknowledge that this is not about translating the word, but the meaning and how we convey that going forward. And so I think that opened up a, a door to possibilities in the future to continue to, you know, uh, adjust terminology to best serve our communities. Do you see two or three thresholds that are that may be the easiest to to aspire to in terms of reaching a lot of people in a more uh, efficient way or, or more quickly? And I'm not saying an individual event, but I'm saying, are there two or three things that that may be percolating in your head right now uh, that still need to, to be thought through, brought to publication, those kinds of things that like, wow, if we can do a little of this and a little of this, uh, it will help a lot. So what kind of what kind of things are in the back of your mind that you you kind of want you kind of want to, to to percolate, you kind of want to give a little more headspace to? You know, one right off the bat, a low hanging fruit that we can address are those wireless emergency alerts, those WIA messages that people receive on their phones. You know, through uh, our study of the quad state tornado outbreak, we noticed that, you know, people that, you know, might not have that culture of being aware of the weather all the time, 
you know, will solely depend on their phones for weather information. And with this information only available in English in some areas of the U.S., I think that can be a low hanging fruit that we can go forward in addressing and at least providing, uh, you know, translations for those WIA messages, because that's what a lot of especially immigrant communities are paying attention to. And, you know, the FCC recently supported this just this last year and has supported WIA messages uh, for not just Spanish, but other languages, too. Now, the only issue is having people to in local communities and local jurisdictions to be able to go forward and produce those translations real time. And so. Uh, I really do think, though, that that can be one of the more low hanging fruit we can address, because if everyone is receiving that at least the more imminent information right now, and it is given in a language that they're able to understand, then for sure, we're, I call that a victory of its own. And it's already started happening, you know, ever since the FCC supported it. Uh, we have several areas in the U.S., uh, you know, I think Dallas-Fort Worth is one of them, where like when a severe weather event happens, if your phone settings are in English, you'll get the WIA alert in English. But if it's in Spanish, uh, you'll, you'll get it in Spanish, which is just a wonderful, wonderful step going forward. And then, of course, uh, you know, more in the long term, I, you know, I'm putting my affiliations aside and really giving my more personal opinion on this is that especially as our nation is is. Uh, you know, becoming more diverse, investing in long term solutions for our for language services going forward, you know, imagine Noah having a language department in years to come that can oversee all of this and provide, uh, you know, the the official definitions and consider social science in this entire big mix, to provide those effective messages going forward and having certified translate translators, of course, being able to handle a lot of these things. But, you know, I always tie it back to the end of, uh, at the end of the day to the weather service mission of saving life and property and emphasizing that that should mean all life and property, no matter where you're from, how you're raised or what language you speak. Joseph, that's all fantastic. One thing before, because I, I know we're starting to come up against time here. Um, I think about the folks north of the border in Environment Canada, and they have all this stuff to do in English and French. Is there anything to be learned from that logistically in terms of doing a bilingual, obviously there's more than one Spanish dialect, but is there anything to to be learned from the Canadians and how they've handled it? 100%. And you know what? I want to give a special shout out to Andrew over there in Environment Canada, because he recently invited me to shadow their translation desk just this last summer. And I got to really learn how that works over there, because for them, it's a requirement to translate uh, their weather watches and warnings and all of their information in not just English, but also French. It's federal law there, so they had to develop a system going forward. And so I, I, you know, I got to sit in and really learn more about how that process goes. And really, we could learn a lot from them and how they go and develop these translations. Uh, first off, they have uh, software that translates a good majority already going forward and not, you know, have a uh, the translators translate the entire message, you know, uh, the, the forecasters in those offices have a select of messages uh, that they can choose from that could be automatic automated translation all the way to French. And, uh, you know, since it's already been corrected before the machine just remembers it, and then the translators only have the job in, you know, translating some more of the key messages and some more of the personalized information, but it cuts down in time. And it's why they're able to do their job uh, so effortlessly there. And they also have a devoted translation team of you know, some of these people, uh, you know, are familiar with with weather and climate, and they do so throughout their job and training. But their background is in language studies, in and they are certified translation uh, translators that are able to understand the different dialects and are able to provide those dialect neutral translations going forward as well. And so, you know, investing in it, creating job positions for this, could really be something that could, you know, not only help solve some of the Spanish language stuff because those certified translators, you know. They may know Spanish, but they also know other languages that can be translated too. Um, and, you know, we're already developing some solutions here in the United States, uh, led by Monica Bozeman. Uh, we're exploring how we can use AI to at least provide that, you know, standard translation that and cut back some time on our volunteer teams so that they can, uh, 
you know, translate things more quickly and more efficiently. Because at the end of the day, we have to acknowledge, uh, you know, these two translations teams are grassroots efforts and, you know, they have to do their operational job on top of translation. And if we can cut back on that time and help them out in that sort of way, it can definitely provide more information going forward as well. And so that's currently being tested by NOAA at the moment to see whether that works. Um, and we're just looking forward to continuing these conversations. We now have a connection with Environment Canada and we look forward to learning more from their strategies and really trying to find solutions here in the United States as well. Awesome. Well, Joseph, thanks so much for joining us. Um, really engaging conversation, important work. And as you said, uh, and work that's going to be even more important as we have more and more Spanish speakers here in the United States. Uh, before I wrap up, tell us where we could follow you. Of course. Yeah. I am on Twitter at Latin WX, <laughs> you know, got to <laughs> Got to really promote what the what the value of, of the research is there. Uh, and then, of course, uh, on the more personal things, we have, uh, you know, our My Radar channels. Uh, we have an Espanol page, too, that we're now relaying information to Spanish speakers in the U.S. and even in Latin America. And that is at My Radar ES on Twitter. And then on Facebook, you can also find us as well. And I have a Spanish speaking page there, Meteorologo Joseph Trujillo Falcon. Uh, but, you know, thank you all so much for this. I I'm always super happy to, to share these perspectives and, you know, really admire that you guys, you know, acknowledge this and are willing to uplift this in your podcast, just because it's just such an important topic for so many people out here in the United States. So thank you all so much. Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, we couldn't agree more and uh, happy to have you on. And uh, thanks for the time. We, we appreciate it. So you guys are uh, everybody tuning in here. You're listening to the Across the Sky podcast. We're going to take one more break and then the four of us are going to wrap it on up. All right, so that was Joseph, and I got to say, really captivating, um, and it really opened my mind up a lot because, and this just goes back to the broadcast conference where we had that talk. I didn't, I didn't realize how many dialects of Spanish there are, and how different things sound to different people. And I think about this ever since that talk. Every time there's a significant weather event here, I always think I know I should be doing more but I just don't know how. So I'm hoping people like Joseph can help share these kind of things um, with us over time. Yeah. And I think what he's done in the short amount of time he's done it is so, is so impressive, you know, for the fact that he's only 25 and he's just really taken this initiative on. Um, I think, I think it's great. And I think hopefully this will really spread quickly and, and do good things. Yeah. It's good to see his passion toward this as well. It is, is so important as we do see the, the country demographically shift and change a little bit that we are going to have to be cognizant of this, that we need to reach as many people uh, for safety as, as well as we can to make that effort to do so. And that's what I love about this podcast. We get so many people that are really passionate about what they're doing to come on here. And, and you know, and Joseph being another one, I think one of the big things that's going to help, and he kind of touched on it, you know, we do have these automated translations that are, are occurring. You see it on Facebook and, you know, there are automated translations of, of audio as well that you see on TV, but they do need to be improved. The one thing that really stood out to me and kind of shocked me is that when it translates on Facebook, for example, for watch, it gives you the translation of an actual watch that you look at on your wrist instead of a tornado watch. And man, that could hurt the messaging so bad. So improving those automated translations, those could, you know, definitely, you know, be such a useful tool to, if, if they're reliable, if they're good, you know, that could get the, that could help so much to get the message out, you know, for especially in areas you know, especially in smaller communities where they don't have Spanish language newscasts, if we had some really good automated translations that are really reliable, I think that could be a big tool. And it looks like we're getting there, but it's just not quite there yet. And that's definitely something that needs to be fixed. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, as we go forward, we'll look forward to hearing more from him and uh, more from other people like Irene in this space. Maybe we'll have Irene on one of these uh, weeks. We'll have her come on the podcast. Um, all right, everybody. Well, that is it. We will be back with you next Monday with another podcast from our Lee Weather team here. Uh, we have a busy October ahead. I'm going through our uh, podcast episode planner, and I got on my watch here. We are going to be talking about full foliage next Monday. Then we have a um, kind of a special. We're talking about the 10-year anniversary of Sandy. That's coming out the 24th. And then part one of two of our winter forecast on Halloween. Hopefully it won't be too spooky for you. We'll talk to you guys next week. Take care, everybody.